Good evening. You know, on the way here, I told Jill, I says, I think this is the first time that I've ever spoke at a congregation where I didn't know a lot of folks. But lo and behold, I step into, into, into this audience and I find out that there's people that know people that we know that, uh, you know, and we, we've got a bunch of the, the Clark relatives here and, you know, and that, that's part of my family also. So it's, it's very important to understand that wherever you go, when you find where the Lord's church meets, that you have family. And I want to begin uh, by saying that it's J.R. Bronder's fault that I'm standing before you right now and I'm about to do what I'm about ready to do. I can't blame him all total because in the back of my mind, my wife and I had, had really thought this through. I'd like to thank the elders for giving me this opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, Jill and I have worshipped at the Vale Church of Christ for over 20 years. For 20 of that years, I served as an elder for 15. Two of those years, I, I was a deacon. Last Sunday was the last Sunday that we attended. Let me tell you, it was quite emotional. You know, you hear of, of elders splitting up because there's problems, or churches <laughs> splitting up because there's problems. But let me just say to you, that Bales, as far as I know, is still in good shape. And you know, when things are going good, it, it's probably a good idea to share that with, with the rest of the world, especially when it comes to spiritual matters. Um, Jennifer and Freed, I, I guess we didn't win out because they ended up back with y'all here, so. But, but that was okay, we really enjoyed that we had the time uh, that we had with them. Uh, I want to say, okay, it worked. <laughs> I, I'm new with this technology, with the uh, with the PowerPoint, but I find that it, it kind of keeps me in order, which is something that that all preachers need to do. At the beginning of the the service, I, I had him read Matthew 28, the Great Commission, as it's known, and you know it says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, except where it's unsafe to be in, where there's not a lot of population, uh, where there's a lot of established churches, uh, and where it's in climate weather. Does your Bible say that? Mine don't either. It specifically tells us that we're supposed to go out to all the world and to preach the gospel. You know, it would have been real easy for Jill and I to stay right where we were in Vail. I mean, it, uh, it, it's been a pleasure being serving as an elder there at the time that I'm with the other elders that are there right now. Um, it's it's a very humbling experience to serve as an elder. But now that I'm starting to get this together to go and do what Jill and I want to do, I'm finding that it's 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 really humbling to to start out to be an evangelist to see the, the support that you get from. The, the Lord's Church all over the country. It's 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 amazing, and at the same time, it's it's very daunting. It's it's quite a responsibility. But we could have stayed there at Vail, and well, there was another option. We could have sold our house and maybe moved down to Indianapolis, because after all, Indianata, my my son and my daughter are here, and Alan and my granddaughter Gabriella. That that would have been a real easy thing to do, because the older you get, you know, you need to get a little bit closer. To your, your kids, after all. But, you know, I, I look at, uh, at Mr. Wright's pictures of the circuit riders, and I'm thinking, you know, many, many, many years ago, there had to be people that, that came up into different areas to, to try to help establish the church. And the first one that comes to mind <laughs> is the Apostle Paul. Think about what he was thinking about when he took his first steps, you know, to go out and preach the, the gospel to a place that, that really needed it. At that time, it was the whole world. I don't know. Uh, you take a look at this, and this is from the Guardian of the Truth. It's the church directory, and it kind of lets you know where the churches of Christ, the conservative churches of Christ, are. And I, you probably can't tell this is the state of Kentucky. I want you to look at all those little 
dots up there, and those represent churches. And look how close they all are together. You know, and I'm wondering, you know, that when when Mr. Stone or Mr. Campbell decided, you know, that that the the true gospel needs to be spread through the United States. As they looked off into the distance, is, is what their thoughts were. And I, I kind of, you know, this, this kind of thing never stops. And I was going to get back to Mr. Bronder here. He came to Vail, and Jill and I had been thinking about going up to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and spreading the word up there for a long time. Uh, and JR came and he presented this lesson called Acts chapter 29. You know, we all said, oh boy, we got, you know, us elders are like, well, we got to listen to him. We got to see what's going on here because there's no Acts chapter 29. But oh my goodness. Joe and I both looked at each other at the very same time, I believe. And I think the decision was made about that point that, you know, we need to get off Easy Street. And we may, we need to be like like some of the frontiersmen that in the church, and uh, you know, to try to get some work started. But you know, things had to move a little bit north. Now I, I kept the other states out. I'm staying with Indiana, so you can kind of get an idea. But you know, there there's quite a few few uh, churches in the state of Indiana right now. And you know the. The early guys had to come up from Kentucky, and you know they ended up in Indianapolis. Do you realize that there are there's 4,000 or 460 square miles in uh, Marion County, and there's 11 established churches of Christ just in that small area. The Upper Peninsula has 14,460 square miles, and there is one church in Sault Ste. Marie with about 14 members. Well, you know, the further north you go, the, the weather gets a little bit worse. You guys, you know, about, know about our weather in northwest Indiana, the, the snow and whatnot. But I'm very thankful for folks like uh, J.F. Dancer. Have you guys ever heard of that, that name? Well, many years ago, he preached at a small congregation in Hammond on Sibley Street, which became a Highland Street congregation. They established elders. Um, and then it, it ended up going to Woodbar and Hessville kind of went away from them a little bit and started to work there. Uh, now they're all back together. But as you look in Northwest Indiana, there's probably not a half hour drive distance, you know, to go to a, a, an established conservative Church of Christ, which is pretty good. In the Indianapolis area, you guys, you got a lot to, to be proud of as far as how many churches is. There's some good things and bad things about that. Um, the good thing is that you know something happens within a church you've got an established group that you can go to the bad thing of it is if you don't like the preacher well we can go you know 10 mile 10 minutes away and we, we can we can go listening to him there but it, as a group here you know I, I, I'm gonna tell you about uh, Sault Ste. Marie but there's a lot of work to be done in, in the area that you live in still So, next thing you know, the circuit rider's up against the lake up there. And he's still thinking, you know, what is it that we, we need to do? You know, uh, the Detroit area, you know, started going nuts with the car industries. Uh, Northwest Indiana had the steel mills. So my, my folks all came from Kentucky. You know, that's that state just south here a little bit. And they moved up here, and it was a good thing that there was a church that was established there at Hammond so that my, my mom could drag my hus or her husband or my dad, who wasn't a member at the time, and, and um, you know have a really good influence on him. But the Detroit area kind of expanded. There was, there was a whole lot of churches, to my understanding, at one time right around in that area. But as the car industry started to fail, a lot of people started moving back south, you know, as, as industry kind of, kind of fell. And you know, you go a little bit further, you, you look at Michigan and right now, well when, when I, I copied that, according to the uh, Truth Magazine's directory, there was eight 
There are 10 congregations in Michigan. Uh, to my knowledge now, there's only eight. There was one in Bay City that just uh, kind of fell apart. There was only two members that were left. And if you look, you know, once you start going north into the state, there's nothing. And think back at that, at, at, at the state of Indiana. Think back at, at uh, the Indianapolis area, or the state of Kentucky. You go a little bit, you know what? People say it's going to be cold up there. Have you guys ever seen a sad Eskimo? <laughs> I mean, when you think about extremes and whatnot, you know, there, there's, there's to be contentment wherever you go. But, you know, there's one little group right now, and this is where Jill and I are going to be uh, working out of, is Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. The closest conservative church, to my knowledge, is about four hours away. Can you imagine that? Four hours away. Um, <laughs> Jill and I, back in 1996, I think it was, we decided we were going to take our kids up for just one real great uh, vacation. We found a cabin that was over in these islands, right back over in here, right at the edge of the Upper Peninsula. And we, were, we, we needed to find where, if there was a church that was meeting any close. And we, we, we seen that there was one right over in the Canada, in Timmins. And so we got unpacked out of our cabin and stuff. The next morning we got up early, so we're going to go to we're going to go worship in Canada. I, we we understood that they both had a French and an English uh, worship service, and we thought, oh, how cool would that be, you know? So we get up to the border, and naturally the border patrol asks what you're going to do when you get in Canada. And he says, well, we're going to go up to Timmins and we're going to worship. She says, you going to the Lake Moss, huh? And I said, what do you mean? He says, well. Timmins is eight hours away from here. And what happened was, on our uh, atlas, you got this, <laughs> the state of Michigan or the Upper Peninsula, and they have these little other places, you know, uh, well, this is, this is Toronto, this is, uh, you know. And we didn't see the legend that was up there that was a lot smaller. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I got my two kids, we want to worship, and there was a, a, a liberal group that was meeting in Sault Ste. Marie, Canada. And we found it, and uh, I thought back then, I said, how sad, you know? I mean, this is so, the, the, the country up there is real pretty. It's real rough in the wintertime, there's no doubt about that. But, but it's just gorgeous up there. So, two years later, we wanted to go back because it was so pretty. And so Joe gets on the... Uh, the Truth magazines directly for churches and we see that there's a the group that's meeting in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. We got real excited. We called. No pianos. Oh, we're, we're in. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, guy by the name of Tony Turner who was a preacher in Wapaka right now. He's serving as an elder there. His son-in-law uh, is a border patrol agent and his son-in-law got transferred up to by the Eskimos and he wanted to help them try to get a church started. <laughs> Eric tried to worship with the group that was uh, liberal in Canada, but they kind of uh, very nicely said, we don't want you to come around no more. Because Eric was of the mind that he was going to be a, a, a teacher. And they didn't like what he was saying. So his father-in-law come up, they started to work. We went up there, we were tickled to death. Man, we're going to come up here every year now. I mean, there's, there's a church up there. We could vacation up there, enjoy the, how pretty it is. And so several years later, we go up there, and Tony Turner's not there. And Eric says to me, old Tim, he says, he's had a, a, a some type of a, he, he was put under for some type of surgery, and as a result, he... Uh, he had some oxygen depletion or something like that, and it really messed him up, so he wasn't able to preach. He ended up moving back to Wapaka with his, his wife and left Eric up there all by himself with about, I guess there was about eight members up there at the time. Jill and I walked into the congregation there, and uh, we are going to go use the bathroom before Bible class, and we looked, and, and let me explain how Sault Ste. Marie is. It's a, it's a strip mall. But it's, a, it's got a hallway on the inside because of the inclement weather. In the wintertime, people could walk to the stores through this hallway. And we're going to go to the restroom before church services. And then on the floor, mind you, 
there's, I think there was four little kids sitting on the floor. They were colored, start colored their, uh, their Bible class material, and the teacher was working on a suitcase sitting on the floor herself. And, you know, the old Church of Christ is very blessed as far as members are given and the, and the growth that we have. And I said, oh my goodness, this is in the United States of America. And I went up to Eric after services. I said, Eric, what is it that we can do for you? I, I mean, I, I, and he says, can you send us a preacher that'll try us out? <laughs> How unheard of that is, is within our, our quote unquote church culture. Why, the preacher has to come and get tried out himself, don't he? And if he don't approve, well. <coughs> and uh, Jeremy Jones uh, is a young man that we had in our preacher training program. And I says, I don't think he's got a church yet. So I called uh, Steve Hewlett, one of the other elders. I said, has uh, Jeremy got hooked up yet? With it? Oh, no, not yet. I called him up. I said, Jeremy. I said, what a great opportunity. And I'm thinking a single man. He's young. Energetic. Oh, my goodness. And, um, you know, this might be a good opportunity for him. It's a small group. He don't have a lot of responsibilities. You know, no kids, no wife. So we sent him up there. He's doing pretty good. But what happens, folks, is, you know, churches need older people. Churches need younger people. Churches need all aspects of ages in, in like, the walk of life. And we went up there, and Jeremy, I said, what can we do for you, Jeremy? He says, move up here. <laughs> I says, well, I'm still working for UPS. And I says, you know, there's only three of us elders. At the time, there was only three, and one of them was pretty aged. And he says, Tim, I, I'm dealing with things that an elder needs to, to deal with. And I, I, I'm, I haven't been, along, uh, been around long enough to, to kind of handle these things. Once again, my heart went out to him. So when we got back that year, I, I went to the eldership and I said, look, we got some guys that need to step up. It's time. You know, I'm thinking very seriously of maybe doing some evangelistic work up in UP maybe going up there and what I'll do is I'll sell my house, I'll buy a house cash up there maybe or something and, and uh, you know that that's what the intent is. We need to get some people to, to come in line because no telling what might happen. We wanted to keep the eldership going. And they agreed and we made Mark Russell our minister an elder and, and John Osborne is another. So we got five elders. Well I retired from UPS. Couldn't sell our house whatever reason couldn't and, and I thought well maybe I, I need to stay where I'm at we went up and made some other visits but our heart still was up there we, we, need, I, I, we felt compelled if you will to go up there and help with this work and start spreading trying to get some churches established well you know the further north you go the colder it gets but once again have you ever seen a sad ass <laughs> To, uh, if you turn to Ephesians chapter 4 for me, would you please? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. It says, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned that the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things this through him who gives me strength you know this the, the scripture here is so unused and I say this because sometimes we say I can't do that I can't do this the, the Apostle Paul is saying yes you can do we limit the power of God especially when it comes to preaching the gospel or spreading the gospel you ever been in a situation where somebody asks you a Bible question or asks you or brings up religion, if you will? You know that scared feeling you get, that little twinge, that, you know, that flight or fight uh, feeling? 
unfortunately, I'm afraid that a lot of people don't use this verse and they fly. And they don't fight for the for the good cause. And they don't stand up and they don't and they they just said, well, I'll, somebody else will do it. We'll just give that responsibility to the preacher, to the elders, or the Bible class teachers. Um, this is where Tibbins was. And as of last year, they don't have a congregation up there either now. It's cold up there too. There, there's need. There, there is a lot of need to have the gospel spread in the in the snow belt, if you will. <laughs> you know, I, I I think this is still considered the Bible belt, isn't it? But they there is a church in Downers Grove that that's all that they support is preachers in the snow belt. <laughs> what a concept! I just I'm finding these things out, and you know, I I I, I had to ponder, I had to try to figure out how in the world could we make this happen. You know, the, the, the winters are long up there. The snow gets deep. You know, the, the eastern part of the UP is where we want to get started, and it's a three-year program that I'm, I'm hoping to do. But I, I, I think that we have to get back to the basics as far as, you know, trying to get some works established. It may be only two or three people for quite some time, but we need to get some places in centrally located uh, towns so that we can get a work started. Sault Ste. Marie is, is where the base is. That's where we're starting. There's all, all kinds of little towns back around there. There's, I, you can't really see it that good, but right over in here is uh, Sugar Island. The only way to get to that is through a ferry. And there's people that live there year round. Um, certainly we can, we can go in the, the uh, Canadian side, but we've got some ideas as far as that's concerned too. Pickford, Pickford, Michigan, uh, Sault Ste. Marie would be about right here, about 30 miles south. If we could get a work started, let's say, in Sault Ste. Marie, so Sunday morning, we get up early, we have a worship service at, at Sault Ste. Marie, Bible class. So about an hour and a half later, we, we take all the members and we kind of come down to Pickford just a little bit. And we and maybe we got two or three, four or five people maybe meeting someplace in that area. We may have to start the, the church back over here, depending on where, you know, most of the people are, are able to assemble. So this is going to be flying by the seat of our bridges, as, as if you, the saying goes. But we're going to have to be able to, to be flexible as far as what we can and what we can't do. Over here uh, by Detour Village is another island that the only way that you can get to is through a ferry, and there's 600 people that live on that island year-round. And the closest work to them is up in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Which is, it, once again, that would be up in here someplace. Then we would go down another 30 miles south down to St. Ignatz. St. Ignatz, you're real familiar with this right here. That is Mackinac Island. Everybody's heard about pretty Mackinac Island. But there's quite a few people that live on that island year round. There's all kinds of and once again, just to give you an idea, well, Bay City used to be right, right down, but the Detroit area is way down here someplace. So there's nothing, nothing at all in the northern part of the state of Michigan. Newberry, once, just to give you an idea, Sault Ste. Marie would be about right there. That'd probably be our last stop. Like I said, we're try, trying to make it a, a three-year uh, program, and hopefully you know, things will work out the way that they need to be. If not, then we'll have to have to keep moving. And then Sault Ste. Marie, Canada. I don't know if that's going to be the jumping off place or not, but someplace up in that area, the whole southern part of Ontario, Canada needs to be worked. It's cold up there. Not everybody, everybody wants to move down to Arizona. I know when your wife gets to a certain age, she likes to be in colder climates, doesn't she? <laughs> anyway, by the way, I'm not I'm not dragging Jill kicking and screaming all the way up there. She's just as excited about me as doing this. The plan. You don't ever do anything without a, a decent plan. 
first thing we're going to do, there is a podunk uh, cable TV situation up there. The last two years that we've been up there, they've been playing the same 4th of July middle school uh, concert, if you will, in this band shell. It's the same one, same song. I, I even watched the direction. I said, Joe, that's the same thing. They need some content. They, they need something to put in their, their uh, publicly accessed channel. And to my knowledge, you know, these, these channels are free, aren't they? Don't cost a thing. It, and, it, and, and they're chartered. They've, they've got the edge on, on the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. To my knowledge, they're about the only cable TV that's, that's up there. Besides direct TV, they're all over the place. But I don't know if they'll let us get on their channel or not. Radio programs, those have been successful all over the United States. And sometimes they, uh, the cable doesn't work, and so all they have is a radio for entertainment. Like I said, the winters get a little bit long. Do you guys realize that Sault Ste. Marie, Canada is an international port? Freighters from all over the world come through there to go to the still mills, to the mines and everything else over there in uh, Minnesota, southern Canada. Try to get uh, in touch with uh, the harbor masters, find out some boat captain's name, get a hold of them, and make herself available to, to teach on the ship if necessary. But that's a world kind of thing. That's spreading through the whole world. Resorts. Everybody likes to go up there about August, July when things get hot down here. Uh, we'll uh, take advantage of that. There's a prison that's four miles north of us. We want to try to get something started in there. It's a personal one-on-one -on -one thing. This is something that every church can do. Find a reason to talk to somebody about the scriptures, about the gospel. Restaurants. I don't know how it is down here, uh, but we've kind of lost in Northwest Indiana the personal thing where people get together in, in certain little restaurants in the morning, have coffee, talk about politics and everything else. And if they can talk about politics, we could talk about religion. Now, can't we? If that's, you know, they said don't talk to religious. County fairs, they're the old fashioned types. We could set up, you know, booths up there. It's not going to be a big deal. They even have dirt track racing. I mean, that's, that's. I mean, it goes, they, they're like stuck in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> While we were up there, Sault Ste. Marie had a sidewalk sale. And all the people that were up in Sault Ste. Marie that had business up there was allowed to take a booth and set it out on the sidewalk. Now, they do this, I guess, two or three times a year, not only in Sault Ste. Marie, but, but some of the centrally located towns that I'm talking about. So we could take advantage of that as far as spreading the gospel. Cabin fever. I guess that's a big deal. You know that the they, uh, from, I don't know how it is compared here, but from northwest Indiana, it stays dark for an hour longer on the 22nd of December. So a lot of people have trouble with uh, depression you know, because it's dark so long. But I, I'm into turning you know, lemons into lemonade. How about being a light in this darkness? You know, we, we see everything that's going on in TV and radio. You know, let the devil have it. Let's, let's use that to our advantage. Let's give them an alternative as far as what the world has to offer. And like I said, we want to drag everybody along with us. We want to use, teach the young man to be you know, part of the worship service just like you would right here. You know, I'm sure you guys have young men training programs and whatnot. But I mean, this is real training. How are we going to get the fire started? This is something you can take with you. Go to Holmes. Turn with me, if you will, to Colossians chapter 4, verse 15. This is biblical, guys. Colossians 4, 15 says, Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. Oh my goodness, we might start some works in houses, just like they did in the Old Testament. 1 Corinthians 16, 9. 1 Corinthians 16, 9. It says, The churches in the province of Asia send, your, are your, you, send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet 
you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets in their home. You know, we, we've got to the point where we think, you know, and this is fantastic, don't get me wrong, but, you know, the United States says in order to be a church, you've got to have a steeple and all the rest of this, but we know better, don't we? That this isn't the church. The guy sitting in a pew is. Next thing is uh, Sunday worship with the idea of the itinerant preaching. I explained that to you just a few minutes ago. Uh, the example would be the Apostle Paul as he went back and made sure that the things that were being taught, and if he didn't do it, he sent somebody to make sure that it was getting done. I eat Tevin. Okay. All right. You're saying, you know, it's hard enough, Tim, with the way that I'm working to get here on a Wednesday night. It's hard to make Bible class. You know, the hope is that when we get started, that we'll have a, some type of a Bible uh, class every night of the week. Especially if we get the small work started. And then once again, it's the idea of bringing everybody that can come with us with us as long as the weather and the roads uh, allow. Keep moving. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, 11 through 15. Whatever town or village you enter, Search there for some worthy person and stay there at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is des deserving, let your peace rest on it. If not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly I tell you, it will be more uh, bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on that day than the judgment than for that town. You know, this is, uh, it's, it's not, he didn't go in there and say, you know, don't try. There, there's, and I, I'm, I'm tickled and I'm excited about this work, but I'm a realist too. According to the Bible, we got a one in four chance. You say, where did you get that? The parable of the sower. Three of those places where the seed got sowed didn't work. But didn't say, well, if it don't grow, stop sowing it. It's a good thing that farmers don't do that, otherwise we wouldn't eat, would we? <coughs> Been part of a preacher training program. We get this thing started. How cool would it be if we could bring some young, expiring evangelists up to that part of the, the world and learn firsthand without having to learn a foreign language? Unless A and that kind of stuff, you have to get used to that. The you know. I, they're going to have to get used to my half Kentucky, half Indiana accent. So, there's a lot of work to be done in the U.S. And as you can see, this young little Eskimo lad, he's, he's cool with it. The weather, the weather's not that bad. You can dress. I can't dress for this hot heat. I don't know how y'all stand this. But I could dress for the cold. I want you to look at this. This is really interesting. This is the Alaskan Churches of Christ. Looky there. How many do you see up there? There's only two. Montana. There's only two churches in the entire state. Well, there might be three. Uh, Craig and Lisa Teal tell me that uh, some of their relatives have started a, a new work in Bolsman. They just went up there, the two of them, and started to work. North Dakota. This is the, the one that wins, if you want to call it a mini. They only got one church. One church in that entire state. It's the snow places where the Eskimos live, right? You know, we sing the song. Uh, Jesus loves the little Indian boy, you know, bow and arrow for his toy. I think there needs to be another verse added to that. Jesus loves little Eskimos, send his gospel where it snows. I mean, <laughs> sometimes we have a tendency to uh, limit where the gospel needs to go in convenient places, I think, the point that I'm trying to, to, to make. 
And the last thing I did as an elder, and what we tried to do, or I tried to do my entire stint, was lead by example. So I told him, I said, this is it, guys, I'm going to do it. Great commission, that means everywhere. Not just where it's convenient. So, I think it's important, and we have scripture after scripture that tells us that we have a responsibility as far as the uh, spread of the gospel is concerned. And it's our obligation to pray for the works that are getting started. And I would ask for you to remember us in your prayers and the work that we're about ready to go and do. You know, the last week, Jill and I did some purging. And that was a tough thing. And I think one of the things that, that you guys can, can help people out with is with their purging. In 1 Corinthians, you know, after you become a, a Christian, the Apostle Paul told them that they needed to purge themselves from the things that they were doing before. <laughs> I was cleaning out the barn, I'm, I'm hanging on to these coffee cans. You know the ones I'm talking about, got the lids on, they're plastic. Man, you could put nuts and bolts in it, it's nice, they'll store nice, you can stack them. And I had a bunch of them in a, in a cardboard box, and I says, well, I don't have room for this. We're moving from a 2,000 square foot house into a 1,000 foot one bedroom cabin. And there's no room for coffee cans. So I went to throw them away, and at the bottom of that box was the mummified remains of some kind of animal. I don't know what it was, a <laughs> raccoon? It was a possum something. But I don't want to take that with me to my new home. And when you go out and you talk to people about the gospel, tell them, you know, look, you, you don't want to take this kind of baggage with you and remain a Christian. People that have not obeyed the gospel. I bet there's somebody here tonight. I pray that, that I would be able to, to talk to you. I pray that if something I could, and we've said this prayer, you know, that there's something that I could, that something could be said to, to convince you that this is the thing that you need to do. You know, as an elder and preaching for Mark when he was gone, I could see people with their knuckles just like that, hanging on to the back of that pew. And I, I know they weren't holding the pew up, but they were trying, still hanging on to, to the garbage when they could be free of the nastiness. Is there somebody here tonight that, that possibly needs to obey the gospel? Let me tell you about the peace that passes all understanding. Let me tell you, you can be at peace with God. Because as long as you do not have peace with God, you won't have a happy life. You won't. There will be constant conflict. And you can see it in the people in the world out there. You can see the troubles that they got their life into because they did not name the Lord their Savior see how you know that they needed to get rid of some baggage a long time ago and obey the gospel and when you look at these people look at them and love them I mean look into their eyes and say I love you because our Lord and Savior loves us our God give his only begotten son you know John 3 16 everybody knows that one but he did he did for me, and He did for you, and He loves creation, and He says we need to do what he, he wants us to do, and He wants us to love creation. No matter how nasty they are, you still got to love them. Somebody's got to love them. Step out of your box. Step out of your comfort zone. That scared feeling, that flight or fight feeling you have, right. don't run away from it. Embrace it. Just like me and Jill are going to embrace the cult, right, Jill? <laughs> anyway, if anybody's subject to the Lord's invitation, please come and please stand and sing. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are lower, these have allured my sight. I'm so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved.
for those who haven't had the chance to lay by in stores that have been prospered. Are there any in here this evening that need to get? Yes. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you now thanking you for another beautiful day. Lord, we're thankful for the jobs that we have that we may provide for ourselves and our family. We ask that we never forgive, forget where our blessings come from. I ask that you be with those who are about to give back that they may do so in a manner pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen.